just a reminder uh, just a reminder to please mute yourselves and any questions during the presentation you can just put right into the chat and we'll um, we'll take questions at the end of the program um, and we're really excited to do this this joint program with group for the East End um, we're gonna uh, I'm gonna talk about the program in just a minute but I also want to talk about all the programs we have coming up in April. I'm Peggy Lauber, by the way, I should have introduced myself, president of North Fork Audubon Society. Um, we have a lot going on in April and even more in May, and it's all on our website. So just go to our programs page on our website for all the information and to register for any of these programs. But we have um, our beginning birders program, which we're now doing monthly on Wednesday mornings, the first Wednesday of each month. So it's April 3rd this month with, and Tom Damiani's leading the group. That's for people that just don't know anything about birding or want to get into birding and, you know, feel a little intimidated. Um, so if we go over all the basics. It's, it's, it's a great idea of Tom's to do this. Um, and then we have our regular Friday morning birders on Friday, April 5th. It's going to be, it's a new Grantham preserve. If you guys don't know about this preserve, it's a new the Conic Land Trust Preserve in Riverhead, just west of Burmere Farms. It's a beautiful spot. Um, so we're gonna go there with Tom, Friday, April 5th. Um, and then we have, um, this is not ours, but um, the Natural History Conference, um, uh, Long Island Natural History Conference. And that's gonna be Friday and Saturday, April 12th and 13th. That information's on our website. You can, that links into the Natural History Conference if you wanna register there. And um, and then our regular Tuesdays with Tom Bird Walk on uh, April 16th. And then um, the program tonight that you're gonna uh, see on Zoom with Marina, she's gonna be doing the same program on Ospreys live at our headquarters at the Red House um, in Greenport, North Fork Audubon Society, the Roy Lason Nature Center on Saturday, April 20th from nine to 11. We're gonna do this program. She's gonna present it live and then we're all gonna go, it's a family, uh, program and then we're all going to go for a family bird walk that will be led by um, Kira Leonardi who, who works for us um, with our young naturalist program. So that's just April. I'm not even going to go into May. You can look at it all on our website. In May we have so many bird walks. It's like mind-boggling. We have like at least two a week. It's spring migration so um, a lot to look forward to there. We'll be going to all over the North Fork to different locations. So um, that's it from our end. Um, I, I we get so many questions about ospreys, um, especially in the spring, of course, and I'm, and the group for the East End does too. So we thought it'd be a great idea to do a joint program to answer some of your questions. And Marina DeLuca is the expert. Um, she works for the group for, for the East End um, as an environmental associate. She graduated from Union College in 2020 with um, a degree in biology and music, She's a musician as well. And, um, she, she's an environmental associate and she's been involved in projects ranging from biological monitoring, land use advocacy, ecological restoration, and more. And she has worked extensively on the group's osprey conservation initiatives and, and in the process she's become an avid birder. So uh, Marina, I'm going to hand it over to you. All Thank right. You. Yeah, and don't forget to mute yourselves, everybody, if you have. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I should be better at talking to screens considering I, it's from my generation, but it's very weird not seeing you all in front of me. Um, but my love of birding, just a short little bit about me, my love of birding actually started, I did a short study abroad program and I grew up coming from an environmental background and I realized that all the birds were different. Um, so it became a way to keep in touch with my loved ones back home by sending them bird photos, and it slowly turned into an absolute love of birds to the point that many people who have seen me perform my music know that I also speak about birds. So anyway, that is a little bit about me. And I am going to introduce you to all things about the osprey, our beloved, beloved bird. Anyhow, um, there are a couple of ways that you can identify them. I'm sure that most of you know what you're looking for. We know when we see them. Um, but a couple of key notes are that their wings have a crook in the middle of them so you can see that when they're flying um, they have a dark brown on the wings above and they're a little bit speckled below uh, the males and females look the same but the females can be larger and they also have a white head with a dark line on the side of their face on their eye so 
And those are some of the key characteristics. Also, you can put in the chat, I have a tendency to speak quickly. So if I'm going a little bit too fast, just raise your hand in the chat and someone will tell me to slow down. Um, but many of us know our beloved osprey. They are migrating back up right now. So we're starting to see a couple. Um, and I just saw my first one about last week with a bird with a fish in its talons. So here's a close up view of them. Um, I love this guy in the bottom right corner. He's posing quite magnificently. You'll notice that they have a hooked bill and that is for fishing. And they have an amazing ability to grip fish and fly them in a more aerodynamic fashion when they catch them uh, going through the sky. So they are a lovely charismatic species. But one of the biggest things that we wanna talk about with them outside of just getting to know them is that they are a conservation success story. Uh, so a lot of things that we hear about environmental issues and things like that right now typically have a very negative outlook. Um, but the osprey is a fantastic example of what can happen when everybody comes together to gather around something and that, you know, we still can see a lot of great environmental victories. So getting to know a little bit about the more about the osprey, um, they are the only species in their family, so they don't have any other closely related relatives. Um, they're cosmopolitan, so it means that they will nest in areas that are more rural or a little bit more urban. They don't mind being too close to people. Uh, they also have a late age of breeding maturity, some birds not reaching maturity until five to seven years old. They will overwinter in South America, and sometimes they'll spend their first year to their third year um, staying there year round, and then they will start migrating into their breeding grounds when they get a little bit older. So they have a later age of breeding maturity. And another couple of things to note on this page is that on the earlier slide, we were looking at fully adult birds. This is a juvenile bird. And one of the ways that you can tell is that they have a red eye. So their eye starts off red and turns yellow later. And they have a more speckled coloring on their back. So you can get a close up view of that speckling here on the bottom. Uh, and you have the fully ad adult bird on the left-hand side and the juvenile on the right. Uh, the osprey can also reach uh, 25 years old. Um, so they can be as old as me at max and they tend to be between seven and 10 years old is the top, the upper end of their lifespan. They have a couple of very unique adaptations. Uh, one of them is this reversible talon, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, so this is part of how they are able to grab fish out of the water and hold them in that uh, straight line fashion. So they're able to turn this talon and it basically gives them an opposable thumb. So it gives them a really great ability to grip onto things. Uh, they have, you can see that their claws are super curved and really designed for catching fish. Um, they also have, you can see on the bottom left hand slide, they have, I have spicules and those are small little um, kind of pointed edges at the bottom of their feet and all of that helps them to grip onto fish when they're pulling them out of the water. So the osprey are pretty much at the top of the food chain. They Their diet consists of 99% fish. Occasionally they will find small mammals or other things, but they are predominantly called fish hawks for a reason. Um, bunker or menhaden are their favorite type of food. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that relationship, um, but the osprey population is tied very closely to our bunker or menhaden population. They also have just a few predators. Uh, so in the wild, raccoons will occasionally steal an egg or maybe a chick if they can get it, but very rarely. Um, and great horned owls and bald eagles will occasionally take a chick out of the nest. They are not, they won't predate on the adult birds, but sometimes the juvenile or young birds they will, typically when they're chick size. Um, so other than these few species at the bottom here, they are the top of the food chain. The osprey is also distributed globally, um, so it means that they exist on every continent except Antarctica. 
Um, so they're highly prevalent throughout the world um, and they are seen in all different countries. I recently got my yoga certification and I was in Tenerife and they actually have osprey conservation efforts going on there, which I thought was amazing. A, a little piece of home very far away. So it's really amazing that they are distributed globally and you can see them in just about any country. So we know them primarily as a migratory species. If you spend time in Florida, they actually tend to stay there year round. Um, they are solitary migrants. So it means that they migrate individually. They don't go in groups, they don't flock up. They, uh, the distance that they travel depends on where they're located. However, it can be upwards of thousands of miles. So their migration journey is truly incredible. Many of the birds here go as far south as Venezuela. And I am going to talk a little bit more specifically about one of the birds, um, but I just want to touch on migration. So one of the primary reasons that birds migrate is that many birds, it takes a significant amount of energy in order for them to keep their body temperature um, at a functional level. And with that energy, they need to eat a lot of food, i.e. specifically foods that are high in protein. So one of the primary reasons that bird species are moving around is because they can't find enough food and the weather conditions are too intense uh, for them to make it. So it actually makes more sense for them to take the risk of migrating and flying these thousands of miles in order to get to a climate that is a little bit more consistent and there's a greater access to food. Um, so that's why they do it. And if you notice, there are some species that didn't used to stay here year round, one of those being cardinals and also Carolina wrens. Um, but now as our climate has changed, um, it's warmer here and they're able to make it through the winter. So they used to be more migratory in the past. So so I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about one beloved osprey who's sadly no longer with us, but uh, he was a bit of a local legend uh, known as North Fork Bob. And so this is his migration route um, flying down. I believe this is his fall migration, but my screen is blocking me. I'm seeing that. Okay. Oh, goodness. Anyhow, this is his fall journey. So this is where he would be leaving the North Fork and going back south to Venezuela. And he ended up spending a great deal of time right out here on our North Fork and going back to the same location in the south over winter. So you can see on each of these, his path varied a little bit. Um, we don't know exactly why you'll see on the following slide that his spring migration path was a bit more direct. Um, so we don't know exactly why he kind of varied his roots a little bit. One of the primary reasons that we were thinking is that they're following food. So they're following fish much more closely after having expent a bunch of energy during the breeding season to get back south. Whereas over winter, you know, it's all about them and they can eat all the fish that they want. So they have a little bit more of a fuel supply and can make that route a little bit more directly. Um, but that's just a hypothesis. We don't know for sure. So this is his wintering ground. So you can see his primary home residence. So it's marked down here with a little house with a flag on it. Um, and so he stayed within the same region just about every year and he would overwinter there and then migrate back up here in the springtime. So this is the region that he was hanging out in, Rio Venturi. And so that was basically his other home. Um, so if some of us have, if any of you have a house in Florida, this was North Fork Bob's Florida residence. Uh, and so he would spend every winter down there. And this is his route right back up to the North Fork, his spring migration journey. You can notice what I was talking about here in the photo, where his migration path was a little bit more closer together in terms of he followed the same path just about every time flying back up, uh, which is pretty cool to see. So this is his little bit of a hometown um, out over the Conic Bay. So this is a little bit of a spread out uh, look at where he was spending most of his time. So all of these are little sightings or pings from what, the tracker that he had. And you can see here from a wider distribution that he ended up going back to roughly the same nesting location just about every year and then stretching out a little bit more looking for fish. So he was probably hunting, looking for food and all of that stuff. Um, so anyhow, that's kind of a general view of what uh, and Osprey does in their day-to-day -day up close and personal. 
So in terms of local osprey history, we don't have any accurate surveys uh, prior to the 1930s. We do know that their population did face threats um, in the early days from shooting, habitat loss, and egg robbing. And you can actually see there's a great photo on the bottom left here of an osprey that built his nest right on top of somebody's shed. Um, so they were getting into some of the same trouble that they get into today. And so those were some of the primary threats to them early on, um, but their population was reasonably healthy. Then we get into the 1960s and we introduce DDT. Um, at the time, DDT was known as a miracle insecticide. Part of the reason for this is because you, because it didn't break down right away, you didn't have to reapply it to certain regions that quickly, and it was able to make a significant dent in mosquito populations, and it likely led to a decrease in malaria. So it was seen as this miracle insecticide, and it was great up until we began to see some of the negative effects of it. And those were primarily noted by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And DDT was later banned in 1972, but I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about how to, we got there. Silent Spring dictates the story of noticing that we are going to end up with no birds left at all um, because of the impact that DDT had on breeding. So like I was saying before, the initial um, reception to DDT was that it was this miracle insecticide. People were heavily promoting it, stating that it was a good thing, the cure-all, everything we needed. But scientists were noticing that bird populations were beginning to decrease at a rapid rate due to a phenomenon known as eggshell thinning. So there, you can see some examples on the bottom. And essentially what would happen is that due to the bioaccumulation of DDT within the bird species. Um, it led to a number of negative impacts on the bird's eggs. So when the parent bird would go to sit on the eggs, the eggshells were so thin that the parent bird would end up crushing the eggs and it would lead to a bunch of non-viable nests. So the bioaccumulation that I mentioned before means that as DDT moves further up the food chain, the concentration of it in parts per million increases at an exponential rate. So when you have DDT in the water, basically what happens is that you have one fish and say it eats one part DDT. Now a bigger fish eats five of those small fish. The bigger fish now has ingested five parts DDT. The reason that it doesn't dissolve is because it wasn't easy to metabolize for a number of species. And that was part of the, the positive aspect in that it lasted so long became a detrimental effect for nature um, because it, they weren't able to metabolize the, the toxin out of their systems. So then you have you know, your small fish that all have one part DDT. It might not be detrimental to them yet. You have a bigger fish who eats five small fish. Now the bigger fish has five parts DDT. And then you get to the osprey who eats you know, three big fish. And now that osprey has 15 parts DDT in its system. And at that magnitude, it begins to disrupt natural, your natural systems within an uh, organism. So this was the downfall of DDT. And this bioaccumulation process wasn't well known before that. And then led to a bunch of these negative effects because as it worked its way up the food chain, couldn't metabolize it out. And then we started seeing drastic effects um, from this chemical on our osprey. And the osprey was not the only bird that was affected. Many other birds that were considered top of the food chain, birds of prey, so falcons, bald eagles, and also pelicans are birds that were very closely linked to eating fish in their diet, led to eggshell thinning across these species as well as some others. And this is what kicked off Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was the idea that we were basically going to rid the planet of birds because of the use of this pesticide. So this created a pretty dire situation, which ended up leading to a amazing era in terms of environmental victories. So prior to this lawsuit um, in the early 60s, there was a lawsuit between um, Scenic Hudson and 
the and Con Edison, they wanted to build a power plant right off of the Hudson River. And it actually led to the creation of this organization called Scenic Hudson. And the decision from that case actually created a unique precedent, which gave community groups or environmentally focused groups the standing to be able to sue larger acting organizations, companies, conglomerates, uh, using the, uh, to protect the environment. So individuals as well as community groups didn't used to have that degree of standing before. Now, because of the effects of DDT, this actually led to what later became known as the Environmental Defense Fund. But here on Long Island, people were noticing rapid decline in osprey populations, and they've become a very iconic bird species out here. All of us are familiar with them today, and that's how it was in the years before DDT. They noticed a drastic decline and a collection of teachers, students, biologists got together and began to study this. So what their findings showed was that you could directly link DDT to the decline of osprey populations. And they brought this information out into the world, and then they decided to bring a lawsuit against the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission. So they brought this lawsuit. They sued the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission for the use of this pesticide. They were citing the loss of the osprey decline on eastern Long Island, and this formed the Environmental Defense Fund. So what my favorite aspect about this is that they actually lost the case. Um, so they did not win in court. Um, the court still permitted the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission to continue their use of DDT. However, the impact made by bringing this lawsuit into the public eye and all of their outreach and education of the public later led to the Suffolk County, um, what, what's today the Suffolk County Legislature, to enact legislation that banned DDT in Suffolk County. This action was then followed by New York State in 1971 and was later followed nationally within, for within this, the use of DDT within this country was banned in 1972. Um, so it took a little while, but I always like to make a point to tell people that even if you lose in court, it doesn't mean the battle is lost. Um, so any of you who work in the environmental world, sometimes it could be a very big uphill climb to get things where we want them to go. But even if you lose in court doesn't mean you lost the battle, so stick with it because, you know, you can you can get there. Um, and this was a really defining moment of the environmental movement in the 1970s. And the energy generated by this case and the fact that uh, the small group of individuals managed to see such a victory with DDT really inspired a great deal of other organizations in the 70s to continue to take environmental action. So prior to DDT, there was an estimate of 80 to 1,000 breeding pairs uh, between New York and Boston in the 1940s. So the osprey were highly prevalent in this area. And then between 1950 and 1975, 90% of that population disappeared. So osprey were listed as endangered. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, endangered means that you saw a 75% of the population disappear over a 10-year time frame. So the osprey had even more than that at 90%. Um, but when a species is listed as endangered, it shows a really drastic and significant decline in their overall population. So outside of DDT, um, individual persecution, so people getting very angry if the birds nested on their chimneys, as well as egg collection were some of the other threats that they were facing, uh, which continued to be part of the effort in terms of educating people to live more constructively alongside the osprey. But the primar primary source of their decline was DDT. In terms of environmental action taken to improve their recovery outside of banning DDT was a great deal of work done by organizations like ours, Audubon, and a number of other environmental groups who really put in a focus to educate people on the osprey, and that helps to change the public perception. One of the other, two of the other primary 
actions that were taken to help restore their population was the construction of osprey platforms. Uh, so many of us are familiar with seeing them. They're out in a the field. The reason that they did this is they wanted to give the birds an opportunity to uh, be able to go through breeding cycles because the primary issue for them was that they were having non-viable nests. So we wanted to get their breeding numbers back into a more stable place and putting them out on the platforms helped diminish some of the smaller um, environment, kind of general environmental predation concerns. So from raccoons or issues with nests falling out of trees um, or them kind of being sitting ducks in that way for predators, we wanted to eliminate that and give the birds an easier and better chance at having successful nests. The other thing that people did was called hacking. Um, and this is a process where they take osprey uh, juvenile birds right before they fledge um, from the location in which they're born and they bring them to a new location such as the North Fork. And the reason that they do this is once the juveniles leave the nest, they'll typically return to the area where the air first kind of flights were taking place. So they found that birds that were, even though they, despite being moved, after they migrated down south, they would actually come back and return to areas like Long Island, even if they were initially brought in from an area like Michigan. Um, so this was another measure used to help bring the birds back into areas where they were most heavily affected by DDT. So just to touch on some of the assistance that we've given the birds and some of our kind of future thinking in terms of continued population management with the osprey, in the past we did a lot of platform installations because we wanted to give them the best opportunity at having a very safe location to nest. There are still places and people who are able to install these poles and platforms. It is still going on. However, the mindset has shifted towards hope, trying to get the birds to return more towards their natural nesting homes. And so this comes from the approach of not only habitat conservation and restoration, but also trying to kind of phase out from the osprey poles and platforms and allowing the birds to go back to natural nesting. And we've been seeing a progressive increase increase in those numbers in general on the east end as well. Um, so in the past, the primary mode of helping them was, was through installing the Osprey platforms. And now we're shifting more towards a conservation hazard mitigation approach to help the birds get back into their earlier days of tree nesting, which you can see in that picture on the right. So post-DDT, here are some of the milestones of the ospreys population of their comeback. Um, so we saw 150 nests in New York City to Boston in 1969. They were listed as endangered in 1976. Um, due to a bunch of conservation efforts and the banning of DDT, they were downgraded to threatened in 1983. Uh, so threatened means that essentially 50% of the population disappeared within a 10-year period. Um, but in this case, it was a positive listing because it meant that their population was getting bigger. So we weren't at 90% anymore. We were 50% back to where the birds had once been. So um, there were listed as 230 breeding pairs on Long Island in 1995, and the DEC stopped their osprey census in 1998. Um, Group for the East End has gone on, um, and we've gotten information from many local birders have helped us to compile this data. Uh, and we have done a continued census, and I believe John Sepp has also done a long-term running census on that, and we've typically compared notes in the past. Uh, so we have continued through the efforts of a couple of groups and many dedicated birders. We've been able to maintain what the population is doing out here since the end of the DEC census. Um, they are currently listed as a species of special concern. Uh, so they are no longer in the threatened or endangered category, but we do keep a close eye on them. Um, Part of this is essentially that they're a sensitive species. So if things change in their ecosystem, you're more likely to see it within them. So scientists kind of keep an eye on them to keep a general stock in terms of how the ecosystem is doing. So this is our data as of 2022 uh, for around the East End. 
after this survey, we are now doing our group of the East End is doing a survey every three years. Um, so we saw continued success and continued growth in our past number of surveys. Uh, so now we've shifted into kind of a maintenance survey. So going out every three years or so and making sure that the numbers are still sustainable. Our typical fecundity was general, the number generated was generally at about 1.3, um, which essentially means it that the population is growing. Uh, so we're expecting to see more of the birds in the coming years. Um, and they have a lot of things that are going for them. Uh, South Hold has the greatest number of active nests out of any of the towns. So our population is a, not only the size of South Hold, but we have a really high density in terms of nesting osprey, uh, which is fantastic. So we had 136 active nests and 193 fledglings. Um, so this is a fantastic number to see. And we have really, you know, this is kind of the tail end of seeing their overall conservation, all the work that went done to actually see their population thriving once again. So this is some data from 2018. Uh, so we've continued to see some of these trends, but we haven't measured the exact percentages based on the 2022 data. So this was done in 2018 and we saw a 50% increase in tree nesting. So this is part of what leads us to the approach of angling towards allowing the birds to go back to natural nesting. We're not only seeing that the birds are starting to prefer that again and show some preference for it um, or some of the prime uh, platform spots are taken and you're seeing more birds in general and they are finding their homes back in the trees where they were. We also saw a 50% increase in the use of utility poles. This was in Southampton uh, and is also another trend that we're seeing within the osprey populations across the East End. So this is going to come back in a couple of slides. Um, they are typically on half of our telecom towers and they <laughs> apparently really, really enjoy Southampton uh, and have taken to nesting on chimneys, particularly in Southampton Village. Um, and I think any of us who get calls can attest that I have gotten more than my fair share of calls from Southampton Village and the birds really like the chimneys there. So um, we have, we have the Osprey are a little, they're a little bougie. What can I say? Um, I apologize if that's young person slang, <laughs> but they do like their chimneys. Uh, and we have done a lot of work in terms of trying to either move nests, relocate nests, and I am very happy to see that there are a lot of homeowners as well who have done a tremendous job at tolerating and living very friend in you know close proximity with the birds, um, despite having some fish skeletons dropped on them from time to time. Uh, but you know we've been really lucky in a number of cases where homeowners have you know, allowed their love of the osprey to, to win out in terms of taking any type of bad action. So we've seen a really good public response to the birds, which is fantastic. So taking us into their nesting on utility poles, um, one of my colleagues says, build it and they will nest. And this is very true. Statues, utility poles, anything that is high up in the sky, they like it. Um, so we've gotten them nesting on stadium lights, all types of things like that. And sometimes once they find a place that they like, they can be very tenacious and don't wanna give it up very easily. Um, but this takes us to one of the group's main initiatives with the focus of uh, our current efforts in terms of osprey hazard mitigation. And this is done in connection with PSE&G Long Island. So, we started getting a number of calls and a couple of really awful situations where the birds were nesting on top of utility lines. They would be up there in a storm or you'd get some thunder or something like that, or a line would come down, the birds would electrocute themselves, the chicks in the nests, and it was a fiery disaster that nobody wanted to see any more of. Um, so our organization, along with PSE and G and a lot of just kind of dedicated citizens looking out for where they see nesting on utility poles, have put together a program to try and first establish what the poles that the birds are nesting on most frequently, then locating where they are and putting up mitigation measures so that we're keeping the birds off of the poles um, and keep getting them into more safe into safer nesting environments. So 
over the past couple of years, and I've done a great deal of work on this project, we have used the data gathered in our previous surveying, so all the way up until 2022, and we did some GIS mapping of where the birds are seen most frequently. So if you look on this slide, one of the things that we first did with this mission was that we identified the osprey tend to nest on double-pronged utility poles. So you can actually see this in the slide here. So some utility poles only have one bar going across the top. The birds like when they have two, it creates a really stable base for them to nest on and it becomes an ideal nesting location for them. So first we identified that those are the primary poles that we're going to see them on. And then we wanted to figure out where to focus our efforts off the bat initially. So what we did was through this mapping, we started identifying what we're referring to as osprey hotspots. Um, so you can notice here on the causeway when you're going out to orient, all those blue dots are osprey nests. So the birds are really happy to nest in here. You can see a bunch of them out at Orient Beach State Park as well, but they don't have uh, utility poles out there. And this area over here in the bottom, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but right across the way is uh, primarily farm fields. So they're pretty safe out there. A lot of these are more natural nests or they're on pillars. However, the causeway going between East Marion and Orient was one of the first locations that we went and took a look at. So. We basically reviewed this for all of the East End, identified these primary osprey hotspots, and then our staff, as well as some volunteers, went out and actually identified the high-risk poles or those double cross beam poles that were away from any foliage that could be on top of it and covering it. And then PSE&G has done a great job of getting out there and putting up mitigation measures. So in terms of identifying the risk assessment of each of these poles, you can see this one on the side. This is a low risk pole, and it's because it's one of those double cross beam poles. So if the birds really wanted to nest on it, they would. But osprey typically do not nest lower than the canopy of where the trees are. So you can see on the right hand side that the tree canopy is much higher than where that pole is. So it decreases the risk of the birds nesting on it significantly. This is a high risk or actually something that is in extreme danger. You can see that the ospreys have built a nest on this pole from the previous season. It's got this double cross beam. There is nothing surrounding it but sky, which is what the birds like. And this nest in particular, we were able to work with PSENG. There was an osprey pole in the near vicinity. So they were able to relocate this nest um, in the off season before the birds got back. And they put up some hazard mitigation uh, measures on top of the pole to prevent future nesting. So this is an example of what those mitigation measures look like. So on the bottom part of this pole, you can see these kind of metal triangle pieces that are on top. They've found that those create a slippery edge so that the birds are not able to nest on it. In some cases, they find a way. Um, they can be very tenacious when they find a spot that they like. And um, in some of those cases, uh, PSENG has actually built them a platform that's elevated up from the pole where they're way less likely to get into any kind of trouble with electrocution or uh, setting themselves on fire. So this is a very positive development and they enjoy lovely views of our Peconic Bay in a safer home. Some of the other challenges that they face um, are the fact that they like to use a lot of beach trash in their nests. Um, so this is always a good opportunity. If you see any type of animal that looks like it is in danger, you can call Evelyn Alexander. They're a wildlife rehab center out here and they do a great job in terms, they deal with pretty much all species um, and their work is really great. Um, but you can see here that occasionally birds get entangled in fishing line, ropes, things like that. Uh, so when you're at the beach this summer, just being mindful. And if you see any type of fishing line, rope, string, stuff like that, making sure that you pick it up um, and throw it out helps keep it out of the nest for the birds. Um, so all those little bits help. And this is something that I know that our organization has looked into, and it may be something that Audubon may want to work on in the future as well. Seeing if there's any way for some of these nests where, you know, we're seeing like real hazardous material, especially on platforms, if they're visible to us, if there's a way to um, find someone to go out there and help clean up some of the nests when the birds aren't here. So I know a couple of environmental organizations are working to see if this is something that we'd be able to do and work on uh, to further protect the birds. A couple of the other things that we're seeing or questions that I generally 
receive one um as their numbers come up the quest for good real estate um continues to become more of a higher priority so some of the birds are taking to nesting on people's chimneys on their docks on their boats uh some of the most successful deterrents that we've seen in response to this are things like this owl here on the bottom so either an owl or a bald eagle replica, because those are their two predators. The birds are less likely to nest in those areas. Um, also putting up any type of kind of man-made deterrent. So anything that has a slippery side to it makes the area not um, hospitable for bird nesting, as well as flagging or anything that basically is just generally annoying to the birds. Um, so even if you have like a windsock or something out there, it helps to keep the attention off of the area that the birds are in. The other huge question that I get a lot is that we have seen a increase in bald eagles on the East End, which is fairly new. And a lot of people are concerned about how their population is going to interact with the osprey population. And the answer to that question is that we don't know yet. Um, so we're not sure if we're going to see a decrease in osprey population because of competition, um, but there are a lot of places where both the osprey and the bald eagle coexist together. So despite not knowing yet, there's a good likelihood that they'll both be able to find kind of their own their own areas and will coexist peacefully, but we're not sure what impact that's going to have on our current population, if it's going to decrease, if it's going to affect them at all. Um, and it's kind of too soon to tell. So it could, um, but the effects, at least based on other locations, seem like it should be fairly minimal um, or not too intense. But we we won't know until time passes and we see more. So this, I believe that I talked very quickly, um, but this about covers kind of our general overview of the Osprey. We have a bunch of resources that we've put together in terms of questions regarding leaning osprey platforms, um, what to do if you see a bird on a utility pole. Uh, the link that I put up here will take you to our conservation page and it provides a PDF document of a brochure that covers a lot of the basics in terms of what to do if you see a tilted uh, osprey platform, if you see the birds nesting on a utility pole, um, and some general how-to in terms of engaging with the birds. And then there is a photo of me doing some observation from our last survey. So this is a overview of our beloved Osprey. Um, and I am happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, that was fantastic. And yes, we do have some questions, Marina. Um, let's see. Uh, Natasha is asking, owls and bald eagles are their predators? Do owls and bald eagles actually eat osprey or what? <laughs> so yes, they do, um, but never, most likely not a full-sized osprey. So they are going to go after the chicks or the young. Um, they're smaller and more vulnerable. So they are the typical prey for great horned owls or bald eagles, um, but they're not, you know, they're not their number one uh, prey source, but they will take the chicks if they can. Okay, and Colette is asking, don't female osprey have a more prominent necklace as far as identifying them? Um, I actually do not know if they do or not. What I, my knowledge base from what I've learned is that they look the same besides the, uh, the size difference. Um, but that's the limit of my knowledge. So if this is, if this may be new knowledge for me, so. Okay. Um, are hawks, uh, Deborah's asking, are hawks a predator or is it the other way around? Uh, so actually, uh, to the extent of my knowledge, neither. Um, most of the hawks that we have are focusing primarily on smaller prey. So the only uh, species that are large enough to actually go after the osprey are the bald eagles and the great horned owls. Um, and that's primarily due to the size of the prey that those two species can handle. And the osprey doesn't go after hawks or small birds or anything like that. Rare, if there's a shortage of fish, they've been known to try and hunt for like a mouse or small mammals or scavenge. But the osprey's diet is 90 
percent fish. Something that I actually realized I didn't touch on is that the osprey is linked um, extraordinarily closely to the bunker and Manhattan populations. And there have been a number of studies that have come out recently that it's not just osprey, but a lot of um, larger both marine mammals and larger species kind of in our marine ecosystems are their populations are very closely linked to bunker and menhaden populations some of the reason people believe that we're seeing more dolphins or whales coming in closer is because of uh bunker fishing restrictions that have actually allowed the menhaden and bunker populations to rise the only other major deficit that we saw with the osprey was in the early 1990s um there were no restrictions on the bunker and menhaden uh, fishing industries. So they were able to take as much as they wanted. And as the Bunker and Menhaden population started to decline, we saw another drop off in the osprey population. It wasn't nearly as significant as DDT, but the osprey was one of the, the relationship between the osprey and the bunker is something that actually led to conservation, to uh, fishing restrictions on the Bunker and Menhaden population and now those restrictions have led to kind of a continued boom of those of the bunker and we're seeing the results positively up through the food chain from not only osprey uh but marine mammals as well and other um upper level food chain predators it makes a lot of sense and you just answered gail's question which was uh what has been the impact on fish populations as the osprey population increases so you should have answered that. Yeah, so I was going to say, just to touch on it a little bit more, I guess that right now that there are so many fish that the uh, osprey have not outfished the number of fish that there are. Thank God, you're so noisy, I can hear. So, oh, don't forget to mute yourselves, everybody, please. Um, do the fish, do the birds return to the same nests each year? Um, Sometimes. So they tend to return to the same region, Sometimes they'll return to the same nest. It really, that's more viable. Um, but we have seen, and we saw it with North Fork Bob as well. I think that he ended up in kind of like the South Hold Hamlet every, area every year. Um, and I believe that they have noted that with other birds as well, where they're returning to their generally pretty close to the same location. So like the same township. And you saw that with their uh, wintering flights as well. So where they're going in Venezuela. Um, so they definitely have kind of a, an attachment to the location, an attachment to their home. Um, if that extends to the same nest, I don't know. Um, but I do know that the birds also, I believe they primarily mate for life. So they usually are kind of find the same pair. Um, so I don't know if, again, that leads to the same nest, but it does at least lead to the same kind of locale and the same partner. So and you know that I had a neighbor ask me because we have an osprey nest in our neighborhood in Greenport, and that I hadn't really thought of this. Like when, so when the osprey pair have babies, and the babies come back, like you know, is there like where do they go if the? Because I think he was assuming that they come back to the same nest. So where do the babies go if the nest is already occupied by the parents? You know, but sounds like we don't really know exactly where. Yeah, they the other thing that would be interesting as well with that is the. Once the birds get to, you know, they are no longer juvenile anymore, they're fledglings, they've left the nest, they don't reach their breeding maturity for sometimes as long as four to five years into their life. So they're actually not migrating up to breeding grounds yeah. in the summer months. So in theory, it would leave a little bit of room where it, a, a young bird from that nest, if their parents have passed on, by the time they get up here, they could potentially return to that same nest. Um, but I don't think that they have to. I think it's kind of general locale more than specific place. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Glenn is asking, is there any information or statistics about how often the osprey need to feed and what are the feeding, uh, what are they feeding on now in March before the menhaden have arrived? So... I think that a lot of their migration, so they do eat other fish outside of Menhaden. Um, those are the ones that they are most closely linked to in terms of it's their favorite food. Um, so it's kind of like if I could eat pizza every day, I would, but I will eat broccoli if I have to. 
Um, so they, the Osprey kind of follow a similar um, mindset with that in terms of their feeding habits. I don't know what type of fish they are eating up here this early. I think it's probably a little bit of whatever they could find. And my assumption as well, to my to the extent of my knowledge, is that the osprey, a lot of bird migration also links up with the movement of fish um, and their food source. So as they're migrating, they may be a little bit ahead of some of the fish or a little bit behind, depending on where they're going, uh, and also what they're accustomed to. So some of the birds that are stopping over here now haven't actually finished their migration. So they're actually going up as far as Maine. Um, and so they're going to be a little bit more accustomed to kind of further northern feeding grounds, which means that the relationship of how much bunker or menhaden that they're taking in is kind of very between locations in terms of what's available to them and what they are kind of used to. So it's definitely their favorite food and their population is linked most closely to that. And it's their primary food source, but they are going to eat other fish that they can catch. And um, also the aspect of they're going to be moving with a food source primarily. They're not just going to come up here on their own, especially in the early months of spring where we're still experiencing kind of not great weather. So they are probably moving with something else that is moving. I don't know specifically what the something else is. Okay. Um, Nancy Walker is asking, why do some stay in Florida year round and others migrate? So I think an aspect of this relates to, I'm going to say, I do not know if there is a specific reason for this, but based on everything else that I know, this would be my explanation for it, which is that in Florida, the birds have a year round climate that works for them. Um, and one of the things that pushes migration is the lack of resources. So in theory, we could see osprey here year round, but our climate doesn't make it opportunistic for them. So the amount of food that they would need to gather in order to maintain kind of their home body homeostasis and keep heat is going to be too much in comparison to what's available in those winter months. So the birds that are in Florida or in South America, they are able to stay year round. And I think that some of their migrating patterns get kind of built into their system when they're young. So they're gonna be following the path that their parents took. So if their parents didn't move too much and they have all the resources they need, they're unlikely to move as well. Um, but I should look further into that and know more. Yeah, look further into that because that's not great. But the, the premise is that the birds are moving mainly in relation to food sources and then breeding ground locations. So those things are going to push them from not staying here year round and going to other locations. And in Florida, they don't have as much of a reason to move. So there's enough there's enough available to them in the summer and winter that it makes it more opportunistic for them to stay where they are. Um, let's see. And... We had, oops, okay, we have Ellen asked, many people ask North Fork Audubon for assistance in putting up osprey platforms. Should people be discouraged from putting up platforms so that the osprey will instead nest in trees? So our mindset is that we're shifting away from that. I think that it's not it's not a bad thing to have something nice for the species. The ultimate goal is to really return them back to the their original kind of ecosystem, which means away from these man-made assistance efforts. Um, but I'm never going to say that it's a bad thing to, to repair the pole or if somebody wants to put one in on their property to make some more kind of available real estate for them. Um, it's not a bad idea. The main aspect of it is that for us, we're shifting some of our conservation energy away from the installation of poles and platforms, and we're working more on these kind of hazard mitigation issues, as well as public education in terms of managing, how do you manage if a bird is on your chimney? You know, like, what do you do over the course of the summer? How do you move the nest? When do you move the nest? all of those questions. So we're focusing more on that. So I'm not going to say it's a bad thing to install a platform. Having more uh, real estate available is never necessarily a bad thing. The goal is that you make them less dependent on human intervention in order to survive. So it's a little bit of both, which is that, you know, we've shifted away from that because we, in our 
collection of resources. This is what's going to get the most, have the most positive impact on the birds, but it's not a bad thing to have, but we definitely want to shift them back to their kind of natural behaviors. Okay, uh, what effect do the cormorants have on the osprey? Um, so they don't quite occupy the same niche. So they are, they kind of are independent of each other. They're all fishing birds, um, but they don't compete for the same nesting locations. So part of the reason that you see more competition between the osprey and the bald eagle is that they're also competing for nesting locations and they're both birds of prey. So you just see them occupy a more similar niche um, whereas cormorants don't quite fill the same role, so they don't interact too much. Um, Allison is asking, we have an osprey nest on a platform that was used for about five years, but has been vacant the past two summers. Perhaps it's too close to a tree and it's not incredibly tall. Is there something we can do to draw them back? We miss them. Thank you. Oh, I know. They're so they're so precious and getting to see them up close. I have become such a fan of watching the Osprey cams to see them in real time. Mm -hmm. Um this is a short aside and then I will answer your question. One of the things I noticed from watching the Osprey cams is that the birds do have a nicotating membrane and that's what protects their eyes when they're diving into water. But another unique adaptation that they have is that their lower eyelid. So if you notice for us our blinking eyelid is the upper eyelid. So for ospreys, it's actually the lower eyelid and it goes up and covers their eye and it makes a great deal of sense because when they dive into the water, they want to have something that's going to block a little bit of that impact versus for our eyes, it's going to, you know, flip the eyelid up. But so that was a joy of seeing them up close and personal, which is an aside. However, um, one of the things to look into would be that if there's a tree nearby, you can cut back the tree a little bit to kind of open up some space there because they are going to be looking for kind of those upper canopy regions. Um, and I think that sometimes they just, their nesting location also depends on where fish are that season and how close they are to it. So there's a lot of things that affect where they're moving that you might not be able to control. Um, I wouldn't necessarily take down the platform, you know, it's like they might come back um, depending on that year. But I would say the most likely thing to do is two things. One, if there, if you have a lot of outdoor traffic around the pole, if your traffic patterns outside have changed, keeping it much more quiet um, around where the pole is would help. Uh, and another aspect would be if you have tree or canopy over the top of it, cutting that back so it's a little bit more exposed um, is going to be something the birds look for when they're nesting. So those would be my two recommendations. And also, you know, keep it there. They could be back. So. Um, Joan is asking, we have watched father bird leave to migrate. How do the baby birds know where to go and how to go? They never have left nest. Oh, yeah, because the first time leaving. Yeah. How do they know? <laughs> um, so. I know that there have been studies that are done on some of this, and this goes back into my biology degree, but I know that it does vary a little bit um, depending on different bird species and their migration patterns. Um, so I have to, I'm going to go and review a little bit of that. However, one of the aspects of it is that there, you know, there's a little bit of trial and error. So essentially what ha starts to happen is that there starts to be less food. So some of it is just kind of a genetic instinctual pull but there starts to be less food it starts to get colder it starts getting harder to have those resources and the birds essentially just kind of get pushed down until they find a spot that they like so they're going to be moving following that food source and it's primarily you know it's it's what young people in my generation do you go out you've never done it before but you have to you've got to get a job you need to try and pay rent you have to find a way to you know feed yourself um, and so the birds are going through that same aspect. So, you know, the, the food is looking a little low, it's getting a little cold, they need to put some heat on. And so those natural aspects are kind of pushing them down. Um, so you have nature to push them out of the nest and um, start them moving. And a lot of the birds are kind of going to follow that sequence um, in terms of getting down there. And there are some additional higher level scientific studies that are done on some of this instinctual um kind of instinct 
towards why birds are able to migrate to some of the same locations. I myself would have to do a little bit of a refresher on that. It's not something I remember very closely, but it's a combination of those natural forces and uh, built-in instincts. And, and that reminds me of a question that I, do, I had heard that the, the, the mother leaves first and the father stays behind when they, they that the, is that true? That I, the timing, I've watched the nest over here in Greenport and I, I, I was wondering like, the babies are still around, one of the parents is still around, which parent? So they, the Osprey uniquely actually shares a lot of the parenting responsibility. Um, so some bird species, you know, the mother bird takes on a lot of the responsibility for sitting on the eggs. Um, but if you notice with Ospreys, they, they take shifts more so. Um, so the female bird does take a kind of slightly stronger role in that. Um, but they do, they kind of trade off. So I don't know if anyone has actually studied if the male or the female is prone to leaving first. I know that, um, I'm trying to remember, I think one of them does pick the nest site. Um, so I think the male might actually pick the nesting site, but the female might actually kind of finish or fine tune building some of the nest. If I'm remembering correctly, it could be the opposite way, but I would double check. Um, and, but I don't know if one of them would leave before the other because they both play pretty equal roles in, in child rearing. So my assumption is that it's something good for someone to study to find out. Um, but I don't know if that's something that's known or not. My, my assumption would be, it could be either or kind of going first. Um, and, and there's this pre kind of tentative period where the fledglings have now all left, you know, they all fly. We were watching this last year on one of the cams. They all get up out of the nest. They all start flying. And eventually, you know, parent leaves, younger bird leaves. And then the last one is like sitting there waiting to go. Not sure if he should go yet. And so then eventually they'll take off. So it's a little, it's definitely parents and then they, um, the ospreys lay their eggs sequentially. So it takes me to an aside, but they lay their eggs sequentially. And so, or they hatch sequentially, my apologies. And so this is partially a um, adaptive strategy to have a successful nesting attempt every time. So the first bird to hatch is kind of the biggest and strongest. And as they work down the line, the other birds are gonna be a little bit weaker in comparison. Um, it brings up a certain brutal aspect, which is that sometimes they have a nest of three chicks and not all three chicks are going to make it. Um, the main reason for this is that if they have a really good year, they are able to get all three off the ground. Um, but it's kind of like the weakest isn't going to make it. And they do this in order to boost the uh, likelihood of a successful nest versus having to maintain, you know, two or three young birds that are all at the same uh, level of strength. So it can be really sad and quite brutal to see that, but you definitely are going to see the kind of older siblings. If you have a nest of three of them, the slightly older one is probably more likely to leave the nest first. And then the following one and that third one is going to be much more hesitant. And a reason for that is he is a little bit behind developmentally because they've hatched in this order. So he's just a little bit slower, a little bit weaker at that time. And, you know, oh, by the end, once they've all made it, they'll all catch up and they're going to be kind of at equal levels. But in those early years when they're leaving the nest, you're going to see kind of that difference there. Great. All right. Well, you have gotten many thank yous. Um, I, and, and one of them is thank you, Marina, for your interesting presentation. Your passion for our North Fork Osprey is evident and contagious. Thank you, North Fork. Oh. But you've got lots of thanks here. So <laughs> great presentation. I think that's it for the questions. So, um, just wonderful. Thank you so much. And everyone remember that Marina is going to be doing the same program live on April 20th at North Fork Audubon headquarters. It's on our website, northforkaudubon.org. And it's a live program followed by a family bird walk at Inlet Pond Park on April 20th. So thanks again, everybody. Have a Thank great you time. all so much for joining. Mm -hmm.